Welcome to this presentation on publishing in peer review journals. My name is Cecile Bardenhorst and I'm in the Faculty of Education at Memorial University. These days there's enormous pressure for emerging scholars to publish um, and the message that's being communicated is that an academic future is dependent on publications. Yet often the, the process of publishing is quite obscure and perplexing for many writers. And the reason why it's obscure is because um, experienced writers tend to learn how to publish and to be successful at publishing over many years of engaging with the system. And they develop tacit knowledge um, from engaging with the publishing process. And this tacit knowledge is often not communicated to newcomers. Um, the tacit knowledge is also developed through, you know, trial and error, working with others or working on their own. And um, over time, this tacit knowledge becomes invisible. And that's what newcomers to the system don't get. So what I'd like to do in this presentation is um, to try and make some of that tacit knowledge explicit, to try and make it more explicit, with the understanding that publishing happens within contexts. So um, it's often difficult to make explicit some things that are particular to certain contexts. So what I want to do in this presentation is to try and make explicit 10 things that experienced writers do. To begin, I just want to point out this article that a colleague and I wrote on this particular topic, making the, explicit, making the implicit explicit in academic publishing. And this particular article is open source. It's, you can access it um, through open access. And uh, it contains what I'm going to present in the presentation in much more detail and with sources so that you can go and have a look at those sources if you want to. So before we begin on um, looking at the 10 things experienced writers do, I just want to mention a few things on, on writing in particular. Um, in the article that I've just shown you that my colleague and I published, we did a survey on the how to publish articles that appear in peer-reviewed journals. So if you do a search on how to publish in journal databases, you will see that there are many, many articles on how to publish. And a lot of these articles are found in science journals or medical, medical science journals, engineering journals, but some in the social sciences as well. Um, what we did was we grouped these papers, these how to publish papers into three groups. And I want to just take you through it and explain um, the value and the problem with these how to publish articles. So the first group of articles focused on formatting. So they would basically take a writer through standard structures of formatting a peer reviewed paper. And the most popular format is the MRAD. You've probably seen this before. The MRAD stands for uh, Introduction, Methods, Results and Discussions. It's a very popular method of structuring a paper. So these articles would explain, you know, how, how, what would go into an introduction, etc. The second group of papers focus on the publishing process. And, and this, this would be the kinds of roles within the publishing process, like the editor uh, or, or reviewers, it would focus on um, the different kinds of routes, you know, what happens if a paper needs to be revised and resubmitted. Um, and it would focus on types of publication. So what's the difference between a conference preceding publication, um, a research paper, and a pr practitioner's paper, for example. Um, and then the third grouping of papers, these how-to publish articles, focuses on advice for specific journals. So editors at the end of a year or beginning of a year would write an article on how to get published in that specific journal. So for example, they would discuss, as in the example that I've given here, in a journal on racial issues, editors would give advice on how to research a problem from a race-conscious race worldview. So I find these papers very useful and I would definitely suggest that if you are new to publishing, you go and search for how to publish papers in your discipline or field. They provide a very useful introductory 
um, well, very useful introductory information to publishing in your particular field. But there is a problem with these kinds of articles. Um, the first problem is that they present publishing as a transparent step-by-step -step process and they present writing as a step-by-step -step process as well. So that if you follow the step-by-step -step process and you're disciplined, that you will automatically get published. And you'll often find that these articles are titled uh, How to Demystify Writing in Three Easy Steps. Um, there's no magic to pub publishing, it just takes hard work. Um, so they present writing as something that's very static and transparent. And the problem is, is that if you follow their steps and you are disciplined, the chances are you won't get published, even though that's what they advocate. So what's missing from those types of papers uh, is an understanding that writing is situated in contexts and discourses, that we write for particular audiences that are quite close to where we're working. Um, that writing is really a social practice. There's a myth that writing is a solitary endeavor, but actually it's, it's very much a social practice. We very rarely publish without engaging other people in our thinking and our writing. And that, that social practice includes power inequities and unequal access. So we don't all have the same um, path to getting published. Um, it also misses out on the iterative nature of writing and thinking. And by that I mean it's not a linear process, it's not a step-by-step -step process where you're moving progressively forward. It's often a process of, of moving backwards for a bit and then moving forward. Um, what's also missing is that writing is tied to a scholarly identity. So um, the more confident you are as a scholar, the more you move on in your career, the more likely you are to um, develop a writing style that is much more confident, to engage in debates in, in more um, confident ways, I guess. So following the steps and being disciplined doesn't always lead to publication because of these other issues that aren't mentioned in these papers. There's another group of literature called, um, loosely called writing studies, which is a, an interdisciplinary base of research and in this research, what these authors would argue is that writing is really not a straightforward path at all. Writing and publishing, it involves submitting, being rejected, resubmitting, possibly being re rejected again, rewriting and resubmitting. Um, that publishing is very rarely solitary, that there are always people along the way who either help you or who work with you to enable you to publish. So it's very difficult to get published on your own. You definitely need other people. Um, this literature also, you know, discusses the geopolitical inequities. And if any of you have tried to publish in Anglophone journals as someone who's writing in English as an addi additional language, you will definitely have experienced these geopolitical inequities. Um, so what this body of literature acknowledges is that writing and publishing is much more complex than the how-to articles suggest. Okay, so now we're going to move on to making sense of publishing and trying to make explicit some of the things that experienced writers do. So I want to look at 10 things that experienced writers do. Number one is that experienced writers target journals. Uh, and what I mean by this is that experienced writers will actually target a paper to a journal. So they'll see a journal and they'll say, what paper can I write to fit this journal? Most newcomers will look at their research and say, where can I fit this research? Which journal will, will take this research? So um, experienced writers focus on the journal and then shape their writing to it. But even if you start with your research as the starting point, uh, what experienced writers do is they will find two or three journals and uh, target their paper for the, the top of that list. They'll write to the audience who reads that journal. And a very simplified example of this would be whether or not it's an international or an, a local domestic audience. So if you were writing for an international journal, what would you need to include um, that your international audience wouldn't know. So you might need to include more about the context, you might need to include more about the methods or the materials, 
um, because the, the broader audience wouldn't know um, what your local audience would know. So that's just a simple example of how you tailor a paper to an audience. Experienced writers also contribute to, to debates in a journal. And what I mean by that is that they will look at papers in a journal and cite them in their paper. So they are contributing to those debates deliberately. And then experienced writers analyze journals. So what do I mean by analyzing a journal? This is what I mean. Uh, experienced writers look at these three different levels and they often do it at an implicit level. So it's not something that's, that's done explicitly. And the three different levels are the register, the genre, and the discourse. So the register is the language of um, particular social groups. And you'll know by now that academic communities often have particular languages. And those languages could include a lot of jargon, uh, abbreviations, acronyms, um, particular ways of using words. Um, and they may also have a particular style. You know, in, in some cases, it's fine to use I as a pronoun, whereas in other disciplines, you wouldn't use that at all. So analyzing the registers, understanding the language and the style of, of the journal. Then moving on to genre. Genre is very similar to format, although it contains much more than that. So a genre would be the IMRAD format. Um, but what experienced writers do when they analyze genre is not only to look at obviously different formats, but they look at similar formats within their discipline. So if you look at journals within the social sciences, um, they might contain the same format, um, but within those formats there will be deviations. So um, experienced writers really analyze what goes into a particular article. And I'm going to build on this in the next point. The third layer is the discourse. And this is really the ideology of that discipline or journal. Um, so what is valued? Is objectivity valued more? Subjectivity? What counts as knowledge? What counts as evidence? And again, a very simple example here is um, if you take qualitative and quantitative um, journals. So if you write a qualitative paper and you want to submit it to a quantitative journal, you'll find that your audience will not value your claims or your evidence or the knowledge that you're trying to produce. So that's what I mean by the discourse and the ideology of the discipline. So if we look at an example, and you know, if we were analyzing these two discourses, or disciplines, um, this is what it would look like. So in the humanities, the discourse is much more interpretive. Um, you would rely on key secondary sources. Validity is based on those sources, your choice of sources, and layering of a critical argument. Whereas in engineering, the discourse is much more objective. The focus would be on methods, possibly experimental methods. It's very pragmatic, focused around problem solving. Methods and materials are very important. If you look at the genre, uh, in most cases in the humanities, you would have more essay-like structures where there possibly wouldn't be headings to break up the sections, and the language is constitutive. And by that, I mean that the language contributes to the arguments. Uh, in engineering, the genre is much more straightforward. So in most cases, it would be the IMRAND. MRAD, Introduction, Materials, Results, and Discussion. So the sections would be broken up with headings um, according to the MRAD, and the language is much more neutral. In terms of the register, for the humanities, the language would be much more persuasive. It would use rhetorical devices. It would be engaging in terms of trying to engage the audience. There might be the use, the use of I. It would be much more active. Uh, the language would be creative and evocative. Whereas in engineering, language is much more formal, passive. There would not be the use of I, but possibly they would use we. And the whole idea would be to report on the research. So these are just two examples. Within engineering and within humanities, you could do the same kind of analysis and come up with different, um, so, you know, different descriptions of what the, those particular journals are looking for. 
So I want to just give you an example of a journal that colleagues and I published in. Uh, we were working on a project to develop a pedagogy for graduate student writing. So we were looking for a journal that focused on pedagogy in higher education. So teaching in higher ed education is a journal that sounds like it would be um, a good place to publish in. So I want to read the first two paragraphs to show you how to analyze what this journal is looking for. Teaching in, teaching in higher education has become an internationally recognized field, which is more than ever open to multiple forms of contestation. So even in that first sentence, you get two clues as to what this journal is looking for. The first one is internationally recognized field. So they're looking for international debates. The second one is contestation. So that highlights that they want papers that are critical and are willing to contest uh, dominant ways of thinking. However, the intellectual, the intellectual challenge which teaching presents has been inadequately acknowledged and theorized in higher education. So there's another clue, theorized. What they want is theoretically based work. So if we look at the next paragraph, teaching in higher education addresses this gap by publishing scholarly work that critically examines and interrogates the values and presuppositions underpinning teaching, introduces theoretical perspectives and insights drawn from different disciplinary and methodological frameworks, and considers how teaching and research can be brought into a closer relationship. So again, the critical is reinforced there, interrogates the values and presuppositions. So they don't want the norm, they want you to challenge the norm. Introduces theoretical perspectives, must be theoretically based. Insights drawn from different disciplinary and methodological frameworks. They're looking for interdisciplinary work and methodological frameworks that are perhaps new. And the last point, they want research-based um, papers. So they don't want papers on classroom experience. They don't want papers on practitioner best practice. They want research-based teaching papers. So that's just to give you an idea of um, how to begin analyzing a journal for a paper. So point number two builds on what we've um, covered so far and it takes it a little bit deeper. So experienced writers analyze genre. Um, so genre in the simplest sense, sense is the format, but it's actually much more than the format. So what experienced writers do when they analyze genre is they really look at how articles are put together. So most research articles contain these components, an introduction, a literature review, a method section, a results section, discussion and conclusion. Um, so what I'm saying here is that most research papers will contain components of the, will, will contain these components, but how those components play out will depend on the genre of that particular discipline or journal. So for example, in engineering, you are likely to find a section that is headed introduction. Uh, you probably won't find a literature review that's often put in the methods and materials section, but you will have results, discussions and conclusions. In the humanities, you probably won't have these sections with headings like this. And the literature review might actually be the bulk of the paper, even though it wouldn't be called a literature review. The method section might only be two or three sentences. Um, but the most important thing to think about is the weighting of these different sections. So I've put page numbers um, next to each section. The introduction is half a page, literature review two pages. And those numbers are completely arbitrary. It would depend on the particular journal that you are intending to target. But the most important thing to recognize is, is where the weighting lies. So you can see that the bulk of the weight for this paper lies in the results and the discussion. Um, that's what you want to look at when you're analyzing the genre. You want to notice how the introduction is written, how long it is, how much weight it has. So I want to show you an example of um, analyzing genre to see how, it, how you target a particular journal in terms of um, in terms of the genre. So this is the paper that we got published in Teaching and Higher Education. 
and um, you'll see that it begins with an abstract and keywords. And the abstract is absolutely crucial because these days most people will make a decision whether or not to read your paper based on the abstract. I'm not going to go into the abstract in this presentation because I do have another video that focuses purely on the problem purpose statement and how you can develop that into an abstract. So you can have a look at that. Okay, so this paper begins with an introduction and it's titled Introduction. And the introduction, although I told you earlier might be half a page, you can see here is a page and a half. And the reason why the introduction is much longer in this journal is because we put forward a theoretical argument as was required by that journal. So the introduction is much longer because of the requirements of that journal. So that's what I mean by analyzing the genre of the journal. So the second section is the literature review, but we haven't called it literature review. We've, we've given it a title that reflects the main theme of the literature review. And the literature review then is a page and a bit, page and a half. And then the paper moves on to the methodology, but we haven't called it methodology either. We've called it a graduate writing pedagogy, which again is the focus. Now the methodology is really long. It's a page, two pages, two pages and a bit. And the reason why it's long is because we included some theoretical literature on the pedagogy as was in line with this particular journal. So in other journals, you might not need such a long uh, methodology section. And then we go on to the findings, which we haven't called findings. We've, we've titled it the case study because the bulk of the paper was around this particular case study. And you'll see that the, the rest of the paper pretty much is taken up with the case study or the findings, if you want to call it that. And the case study is subdivided into themes with different headings. Okay. And then the final section of the paper is a discussion. And that's where we pull together the, the theory, um, the methodology, and the case study. And we don't have a conclusion. So you can see how the components are there, but the, um, the way it's played out in the paper is substantially different. So that's what I mean by analyzing the genre of a, an article in a journal. Number three, experienced writers understand the basics of a paper. And again, this builds on what I've been saying already. Um, but what experienced writers understand is that papers are not made up of facts. In some disciplines, uh, arguments are so deeply embedded that papers do look like they're made up of facts. But, but in most cases, um, papers are an argument. Re research papers are an argument. Because you're making an argument about the about the need for this research, you're making an argument about the methodology that you're using, you know, the whole paper is an argument at some point. In other disciplines, the arguments are up front so that you can see them, but in some disciplines, they're quite deeply embedded. So research papers are made up of an argument conceptualized around a problem. And the reason why you have a problem is that if, if your research doesn't identify a problem, your reader's saying, well, why do I need to read this? Now, often you have a problem, but it's not articulated enough as a problem. And then your reader saying, so what? So the more you can articulate your research around a problem, the less you're going to get comments about the relevance of the paper, the so what, and uh, why should we read this? So think about how you've presented your problem in the paper. So this is what experienced writers do, is that they will understand and think about how they are arguing and they will understand and think about how they're presenting the problem that their research is shaped around. Um, experienced writers also understand that you're making claims in a paper and those claims become more truth-like dependent on, depending on the evidence. And the evidence is based on the audience. So if the audience accepts that evidence, if they are convinced by your evidence, then they will accept your claims as being more truth-like. If your evidence does not convince them, then it sounds more opinion-like. So again, um, a very simplistic argument here is qualitative, quantitative. That if you present 
a qualitative argument to a quantitative audience, they will not be convinced by your evidence. Um, I do have another video, as I mentioned earlier, that is devoted entirely to developing the argument, the problem. Um, so you can have a look at that if you're interested. So point number four is that experienced writers continually conceptualize. So even though um, you may have conceptualized your research at the beginning stage when you're first putting together the research project and collecting data, when it comes to a paper, what experienced writers do is they think about how they're going to shape that paper for a particular audience. So for each paper that they work on, they reconceptualize what they're doing. So what they look at is the framing. So what particular angle am I going to use to reach this audience or journal? So for example, in the Beyond Deficit paper that I used as an example here, um, we targeted that journal because we knew that they would, you, they would appreciate the single case study. Other journals wouldn't uh, accept that as being valid but we knew this journal would. So we framed the whole paper around the single case study. So that's what I mean by framing, is that you're thinking about the journal and the audience, and then you're shaping the paper in relation to that. Experienced writers focus on the problem, they highlight the problem because they realize this is the reason to read or publish the paper. Experienced writers clearly articulate what the purpose of this paper is. So they will have some way in their introduction the purpose of this paper is to, and that purpose might be different from the research project. It's the purpose for this paper. Um, experienced writers focus on the story they want to tell. So even if they're using the IMRAD format, they will focus on how they want to tell that story within that structure. So ordering within those different sections is important for them. And then experienced writers focus on a key message, an overall key message. So what is the one thing that I want readers to get from this paper that they will take away from uh, after having read this paper? Um, that's the end of this section. We've broken this presentation down into three sections. And in the next part, I'll continue with what experienced writers do. And then in the third part, we'll, um, discuss, we'll discuss the review process and what experienced writers do with the review process. And then I'll summarize across the three parts.